Well, they pulled it off. I wasn't sure they would. I wasn't sure they could. An amicable split that truly seems to be mutual, that seems to be as happy as Bill Belichick could ever be, and that results in Belichick walking away and going wherever he wants to go next without any fights, without any acrimony, without any of the stuff that would have been far more interesting, frankly, than what we saw yesterday. It would have been a lot more interesting if Bill Belichick had said what Pete Carroll said the other day. He said, it's not mutual. They fired me. But he didn't say it. And, and that's that, Peter. After 24 years, Bill Belichick, head coach of the New England Patriots, Robert Kraft, owner of the Patriots, tell the media together that Belichick is moving on. We knew it was coming, but still, there's something about the finality of it that really was jarring, even though we were fully prepared for it. I actually think it is mutual, Mike, because <clears throat> Bill Belichick is a pragmatist. He saw the end of the line. He knew that on his roster in New England, uh, he didn't have a quarterback. He knew that he had left this team in horrendous shape on, off on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, he had drafted terribly. You know, between 2014 and 2020, he did not have a single player picked in the first three rounds that the organization then gave a second contract to. That is historically bad drafting. So Bill Belichick basically got out while the getting was good. If he had coached there one more year and gone three and 14, tell me, would the Arthur Blanks of the world be lined up to hire a 73-year-old man in 2025? I don't think so. At least now he gets out of there with the vast majority of his dignity and football acumen intact. And he gets to go somewhere else. I presume he's going to get a job. And in my opinion, it's best, far better for the Patriots than trying to uh, do something just so that Bill Belichick could break the all-time record for coaching victories in New England. Because think of it, Mike. People say, well, geez, he only needs 15. And what I say is, okay, you only need 15. You pretty sure you're going to get that in the next two years? I'm not. So he gets to go somewhere else. And I think, as you think, Mike, that it's probably for the best for all parties that this amicable divorce happens. One of the more fascinating moments yesterday came when Robert Kraft was meeting with reporters separately. Belichick and Kraft took no questions. They made their statements and they exited stage left, I guess it would have been for them. Kraft came back a couple of hours later. And as to this idea that was floated by Belichick on Monday of taking less power, Shereen Williams had a great observation on Tuesday. I viewed it as an effort by Belichick to make it harder for Kraft to remove the Band-Aid. If Belichick is saying, oh, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. Shereen sees it as a message to other teams that he's not going to walk through the door insisting that he be in charge. Kraft explained that it was gradual, that Belichick gained full control over the team over time. And it wasn't until after their third Super Bowl win that Belichick was fully in charge. And the problem now with clawing back some of that power it creates confusion in the building. You've got the guy who previously ran Absolutely. everything answering Absolutely. to someone else. I'm reminded of what happened with Mike Holmgren in Seattle. Remember when they brought in a GM and took away his personnel power? That just doesn't work. You can say, we're going to make it work. But when the guy who's used to doing it his way all of a sudden has to do it with the input of someone else who has more power over the roster than he did, that just sets the stage for a big, ugly mess. There's no way it would have worked. And I applaud Kraft for saying what was totally pragmatic. Because I kept hearing this week, well, you know, Belichick could give up the power and bring in a real general manager and fire his entire offensive staff and do this and everything. I mean, you know, enough, enough. It just, first of all, 
I mean, might it have worked? 10% chance, maybe. But in, Mike, in, in the NFL, nothing works without a quarterback. I don't care. We can talk about this till we're blue in the face. Doesn't matter. Nobody wins in the NFL without a quarterback. And so I look at this and say, this is Robert Kraft saying, we're going to get a traditional structure. We're going to get a general manager who runs the draft. And we're going to get a quarterback who coaches the team or a coach who coaches the team. And we're going to get a new quarterback. Now, it's a long uphill climb without any question. But if you're Robert Kraft and Jonathan Kraft, Mike, you have to feel today, today is the first day of the rest of our lives. And we're damn <laughs> happy about it. And, <laughs> and I think they are. I think they are. Robert Kraft, as he said yesterday, he is a sentimental guy. And this is what I was told about what was going to happen, that the only way it could get fixed if the sentimentalist in Robert Kraft took over, you know, and basically said, oh, come on, I want Bill to break the record here. I want him to retire a Patriot. That's the right thing. It probably is, quote, the right thing, end quote. But there's also an old saying, time waits for no one. Our time is all it's going to come for all of us. It's going to come for me, going to come for you. It's going to come for every coach in the NFL. Came for Pete Carroll, Nick Saban, and Bill Belichick in a 24, in a 17 hour period this week. One of the most amazing things, <clears throat> I think, in football history is that in 17 hours, three, two particularly, and then Pete Carroll, obviously, one of the great coaches. And, and they're all gone. And it's a great point to make. These three men, all in their 70s, all who would have to coach next year at either 73 or 72, are all gone. And all born within seven months of each other in the Hoover administration. And, you know, so time marches on. And... And I agree with every, I talked to Rodney Harrison about this yesterday. He goes, I am so happy that Bill Belichick and Robert Kraft stood there together because that's the way it should be. This shouldn't be a time of guys being ticked off at each other. This should be a time to celebrate what they did. And I have no idea if Belichick had to be drag kicking and screaming into that event yesterday. I kind of doubt he did. He understands life and he understands football and he knows that he would have looked extremely small if he didn't show up yesterday and say thanks for the memories when he realizes he is playing to a new audience of owners who may be hiring him and frankly the fans of the various teams that will be interested in bill belichick might not be as interested in bill belichick we've done some very unscientific polling via the always reliable social media about how excited fans would be about Bill Belichick taking over their team. And I did a very generic question a couple of months ago. If your team is looking for a coach in the next cycle, do you want Bill Belichick? And it was an overwhelming no. So it's already going to be not an easy sell. It's not as automatic as it would have been five years ago. Five years ago, it's a no-brainer. Anybody that can get Bill Belichick wants him. Fans, media, everyone. Now, okay, well... You got to do it the right way. You got to put the guardrails on. You got to have a roster already in place. Forget about shopping for the groceries to cook the meal. You want to go to a place with a fully stocked kitchen. So all he does is coach the team that's there. That wouldn't have been an issue five years ago. And so I think he recognizes he can't be perceived as storming out angrily, curmudgeonly, and in a way that would not be appealing at all to the next owner that's got to work with him. Another thing that happened yesterday, the closest thing to, I think, any criticism, and it was indirect, but it's when Kraft said this, we all need checks and balances in our life. We need what I say, and I call it, we need Dr. Nose around us, people to protect us from ourselves. And see, Belichick didn't have that. And it's, it's possible that if Kraft didn't have that, he wouldn't have removed the Band-Aid. It could be that his own Dr. No was his son, Jonathan, 
who kept him on track saying, we ha- it's time, it's time. I know you're feeling sentimental. I know a lot's happened in 24 years. You're a fan of the team. You want a perfect ending. There is no perfect ending. It's time, it's time, it's time. But this idea that there, there wasn't an appropriate check or balance against Bill Belichick, they allowed that situation to manifest itself because they were winning. The problem is you remove the winning and you have an organization that teeters on the edge, Peter, of becoming dysfunctional. You know, I thought yesterday when I was watching this, I thought when I look back at, you know, sort of the greatness of this franchise, one of the things I'll always think of is essentially, you know, sort of the line of demarcation in how the Patriots drafted. And I'm not saying they didn't draft anybody good uh, in the second half of the Belichick reign. But I think that he basically, once he consolidated everything and didn't really have anybody in the organization who could push back on him. I'll give you an example. I, I think it started to go downhill, although very gradually. Um, I think it started around 2011, 2012, right in there when I remember one year they drafted a cornerback, an oft injured cornerback from Virginia named Ross I Dowling uh, in the second round in, in uh, 2011. And, and again, and I stress, he made some good draft choices after this. But to me, when I heard this story, I started to think, well, geez, he better be a genius if things like this keep happening. He, he didn't tell a soul he was taking Ross I. Dowling. And, I mean, I'm sure he told Kraft or, or whatever, but the scouts in that organization did not know when Ross I. Dowling was picked. They, they heard it over the, the loudspeaker or on TV or whatever, and they said, wow, we took Ross I. Dowling? And, and that, to me, you know, not having a clue with people in the organization who honestly should have a clue. There should be arguments about this and, and all this. That to me, you know, and I'm sure that has that is risen and that has increased over the last few years. To me, I think that is one of the things that kind of led to where we are today, that Bill Belichick was the great and powerful Oz and he didn't have a, whoever it is, a Pioli or, or even in the last couple of years, a Casario, you know, to push back. I have no idea if Casario did. I know Pioli did. But so I, I just think now when you look at this, signs of problems were coming. And in today's football, in the modern football, you cannot be a totally do-it-all guy. You just can't. And Bill Belichick tried to be that. And if they tried to take it back, as you said, Mike, and as Kraft said yesterday, it just wouldn't have worked. What happened yesterday was far and away the best thing for everybody concerned. And I think that that obsession with control and power and ultimately secrecy, it's deep-rooted. He grew up on the campus of the Naval Academy. There's always been that military connection to football, yep. even when you aren't at a military academy. And I think one of the problems, as the game continued to evolve and grow and innovate from a personnel standpoint, he just didn't trust, trust enough people. And, and I think, plain and simple, nobody knew it was Ross I. Dowling because, and Chris has explained this from his time working there, nobody knows anything. He doesn't want anybody to know anything because he doesn't trust that someone's going to yeah. run their mouth. Anonymous sources talking to reporters, who's texting whom, who's calling whom. He doesn't want to have to worry about that. This is one of the reasons why two of his kids work there. There are a lot of reasons why nepotism happens in coaching staffs. But one of them is if you can't trust your kids, you can't trust anybody. And you got to trust somebody, so you may as well trust your kids. And look, Mike, the other thing about this is, and I'm not saying that you know, you, you, you have to trust X number of people in your organization or, or talk to people about such and such. But there comes a time when you believe that, and even if you are 
a little bit humble about it. There comes a time when you believe that you're the great and powerful Oz. And I think Bill came to believe that. And why wouldn't he? He won six Super Bowls with the 199th yes. pick in the draft as his quarterback. Why wouldn't he think I'm smarter than everybody else? And and honestly, you know, there aren't many times when I would really argue that he wasn't the smartest guy in the room. I would just say over the last, most of the last decade, overall, his drafts are embarrassing. They're embarrassing. Mike, listen to 2014, first round pick, Dominique Easley. 2015, first round pick, Malcolm Brown. 2016, first round pick, Cyrus Jones. I'm sorry, first pick, Cyrus Jones. 2017, first overall pick, but in the third round, Derek Rivers. 2018, first round pick, Isaiah Wynn. 2019, first round pick, in Keel Harry. And then Kyle Duggar, who's been a pretty good player, 2020. Then Mac Jones in 2021. I don't want to sound crass about this, but Mac Jones might have been a good quarterback. Can you imagine... Mac Jones playing for Kyle Shanahan versus playing for Bill Belichick, uh, you know, uh, and the cast of thousands who coached him after Josh McDaniel left after his rookie year. I, I it, it just, this needed to happen. In some ways, it might have been a year overdue, but it needed to happen. And before things really went off the rails. It was embarrassing enough this year. For a Bill Belichick team to be nine games under 500, that is embarrassing. So, you know, before it would get worse, because I think it would have, you know, time to go. You mentioned to kill Harry. The Patriots took him in round one of 2019 with Debo Samuel, DK Metcalf, and A.J. Brown still on the board. And as it relates to Mac Jones... This is something I mentioned last weekend on Football Night in America, and I think this is a real factor in the disintegration of the relationship. The idea, and this gets back to the hubris you were speaking of. When you're changing the name of your boat every year because you keep winning another Super Bowl ring, you get to the point where you think you know what you're doing. I mean, he was. In a salary cap free agency era, the only one to crack the code and to be as dominant. And even though it tailed off the last five years, six Super Bowl wins in 25 year, in 24 years, that's 25% success rate in a league of 32 teams. Are you kidding me? So I could see why he'd feel that way. And, and that's why he thought it was a good idea to make Matt Patricia the offensive coordinator. And I remember sitting right here saying, if anyone else was doing this, we would think they had lost their damn mind. And what happened? It was a disaster. And I think that, and as you said, Peter, maybe it was a year overdue. Maybe it should have happened last year after the Matt Patricia experiment, unchecked, with no one around to tell him he shouldn't do it. And if anyone above him just raised the question, you know, he's going to roll his eyes. You know how he is. Roll his eyes and harumph. No one, he's not going to listen to anybody at this point. I know what I'm doing. He's a great coach. So what if he's only been on the defensive side of the ball his whole career? I'll flip him over and he'll be a great offensive coordinator. And it was a disaster. And what did you got a guy who was a pro bowler, and I know the pro bowl doesn't mean anything because they go three guys and then a fourth guy, then a fifth guy. But he was a pro bowler as a rookie. And there was regression last year. And I think it also fractured the relationship between player and team to the point where who knows what they're going to be able to do with Mac Jones going forward. And, and that gets back to a point I always make. That first stop on a quarterback's NFL career – is so influential in whether or not he's going to be good or bad. You can put him with one team, and it'll be great. You put him in with another team, and it's a disaster. And it started great, but it became a disaster in New England. And that was hastened by Matt Patricia being given the offensive coordinator job by Bill Belichick. And when he got that job, Mike, there's it, it, that, I, I mean, look, there are about five lines of demarcation. But to me, the most important player on your team, in your organization, I mean, the Patriots forced, forced, 
you know, their young quarterback, Mac Jones, to go out and seek advice, thoughts, help from people outside his outside the building, which reportedly really ticked off Bill Belichick. And the reason that he had to look elsewhere is because he had amateurs coaching him. And, you know, that's, it's sad to say that, but he did. History shows that he did. And to me, the end of Mac Jones in New England, or at least the end of him as anything but a guy who will enter 2024 with a law as a long shot competitor for the starting job at quarterback. Uh, they've got to either draft somebody high or bring somebody in, whatever. But the end was the absolutely totally embarrassing throw that he made in Germany at the end of the game against the Colts that essentially cost them a good chance to win the game. And I mean, just a, a brain lock kind of interception that that just has to make him just sick looking at and thinking about but and that but that was a long time coming that's in mid-year of year three of Mac Jones and that throw right there in that game really said to me Mac Jones is a ruined quarterback and he shouldn't have been a ruined quarterback if he had either Josh McDaniels for the full tenure there, or if he had a really good quarterback coach in year two, he would have continued to progress. I think it's not smart to blame Bill O'Brien for Mac Jones's downfall. He inherited a you know an eighty percent ruined player. So you know you try to scotch tape him and put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but it was too late. So. I don't know. You know, you can look at a lot of reasons why this whole thing went off the rails, but the Mac Jones experiment is a huge part of it. And you mentioned the Germany game. Based on the things Robert Kraft said in advance of that game, that was a much more important contest yeah. than the average random regular season game. And and they they lost it. And our friend and colleague Tom Curran had since pointed out that that was the moment that Kraft had the realization it was time to move on. There was still an opportunity. If they had finished hot, he would have changed his mind. But that was really the key. That was the big game. That was the closest thing to a Super Bowl that the Patriots have been in since Super Bowl 53. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.